let's get this show started. We have three Snowflake data superheroes all on, on one call, and it's a rare treat, so we want to make the most of it. We have a very technical session. We'll be talking about Snowflake tags, a very specific topic in data governance and data security. We're going to have examples. We're going to have Q&A at the end. So by all means, write in, ask questions. We'll try to cover them during the talk, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can afterwards. And while people are still joining, we wanted to, for those that don't know us, um, we wanted to give a little brief introduction and also uh, play a little game of fun facts. So we have three data superheroes. We're going to talk about our data superpower. So let's go around. I'll start first. Um, Serge Grishkovich, um, product success lead at SQL DBM and author of uh, Data Modeling with Snowflake. My data super power would be, I call it doom sense. So I'm not great at maybe coming up with the most brilliant solution off the top of my head right away, but I have this like sixth or seventh sense of when I see a solution being proposed, if there's a hole in it, something will, will alarm bells will ring and I'll say, uh-uh, you didn't consider that. Um, I wish it worked the other way around. I wish I could just come up with good solutions, but I can poke holes in bad ones pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> That's great. So over to you, Keith. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Keith Belanger. I am product evangelist um, at SQL DBM. I've been here for almost two months now, um, but prior to that was in the in, in consulting um, and a lot with uh, obviously with Snowflake and uh, being a Snowflake data superhero. And I'm going to say my superhero, I'm going to put on my special glasses, right, is I'm going to call it supervision. Um, for the most part, my uh, superhero power was organizations, say, new to Snowflake and coming up with overall strategy on how to use accounts, how to use different databases, and how to use all of the um, components of Snowflake that are not on traditional databases, because um, it is a whole different animal to most um, leverage the, the powers of, of Snowflake. So yeah, that would be my superhero. Over to you, Veronica. Awesome. Uh... <laughs> First of all, it's so exciting to hang out with the two of you. Uh, I've met both of you in person. This is just special. Um, my gosh. So Veronica Durgan, um, currently I oversee data at Saks. Uh, so my, and that's my day job, the one I get paid for. And then I have a night job, which is a snowflake <laughs> superhero, which I don't get paid for. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's okay. It's fun. So my superhero, I am, I'm, I connect the dots. I've always been good at troubleshooting. It's just how my mind works. Like I, I, I can logically walk through steps and connect the dots and I can figure things out. Uh, Serge, you say you, you're actually like a natural born QA. Uh, it is incredibly difficult to find holes in not common paths. Mm -hmm. Super, like th that's a true, true, like superpower. So you should like embrace it. I, it's actually having people like that on the team mm -hmm. that find uh, situations and use cases where solutions don't work is is brilliant. You know, I think yeah. that's what's great about all the superheroes is everybody has a different power. Like I hear what you guys are saying and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys can do that, but it does, it's helpful having like the relationships with people like both of you that, you know, you get that whole entire, um, you know, end to end specialties and that can help be, uh, be supportive. So it's great. Yeah. Maybe I think we're onto something. Maybe this is the, <laughs> the, the, the beginning, the birth of a snowflake, uh, superhero consultancy yeah. Yeah. Legion of doom. For that. Like, <laughs> hall of justice yes yeah all right we're ready to start Go i'm for gonna it. share my screen uh so the other superpower that i didn't mention is color matching so i didn't realize that i matched my shirt today to my slides uh, I also have a snowflake mug. So uh, just so you know, this is a new level of color matching even for me, but here we are. All right. Um, so always start with memes, this fun one. Uh, well, hello and welcome everyone again. Again, such a 
treat to be able to hang out with the fellow data superheroes. Um, and like we like I feel like we should maybe like defend the world from the bad guys or something, right? With our superpowers that we just discussed. But the cool thing is today we're going to talk about security and how to protect our data from the bad guys. So maybe we will save the world. Okay, so we already talked about it. Snowflake Data Superhero, uh, part of the superhero program. We Each one of us got an amazing avatar. This is my old one. I actually have two and I brag about it. Uh, and uh, Superhero Cape, which I think is the coolest swag ever. Uh, SKLDB, maybe you should step up your game a little bit with some chill swag. Um, anyway, so here's a QR code. Uh, it'll take you to my LinkedIn. If anybody wants to connect, I'm always happy to chat, I um, chapter lead Data Vault Snowflake user group. So if you wanna talk about data modeling, um, I know both Keith and Serge are passionate about data modeling as well. Um, data Vault, happy, happy to chat. Please don't sell anything to me. I get a lot of those messages. I can't, I don't have enough time to reply to those. Um, anyway, so today I have some slides. I'm gonna probably speak very fast because I wanna make sure we have enough time for q and I know Serge has a demo of SQL DBM with tags, which is super exciting for everybody to see. So we'll talk about Snowflake data classification, tagging, data masking. We'll do a little bit of data vault modeling, not much. We'll action the right to be forgotten. Um, and like I said, let's we'll make sure we have some time for q and all right, so I worked in data my entire career. I'm not an expert in physical cybersecurity, but I just wanna kind of give you a quick overview of what it takes to protect any company's data. So not, I mean, it's not news to anybody that data is an asset, but not all data is created equal and it doesn't require equal levels of protection. So before we start on the journey of protecting our data, uh, we actually need to have a deep understanding of the data that we have. So I don't know if some of you may be here in the US and you remember this old public service announcement. It was, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Mm -hmm. So ask yourself the same question about data at your company. Do you know where your data are? Uh, the very first step that any organization needs to take is to create a data map. We need to identify data that's being collected and where it's being stored. So this step is also very important from compliance perspective. We need to identify critical data. So having a data map will help identify areas and departments that hold critical data. The next thing is we need to assess threats. We can't implement effective security measures if we don't understand potential threats, right? And, and the types of malicious attacks. And of course, once we have the three above, we need to plan and implement necessary security measures. Um, so these are the seven layers of security that exist at all of your companies. You might not realize that, but they do. They're kind of like Swiss cheese. Basically each slice is not perfect. It has holes in it, but when we stack them together, they provide the best level of protection. So I'll do a quick dive in each layer. And I just want to note that the top layer is the most vulnerable. And this is the one we're going to start with first. Um, I'll give you a second. Again, love memes, cartoons, <laughs> and superheroes. Um, Data-driven, information-driven, data to fingertips all the time, self-serve analytics. What this means is that every user at a company has access to data in order to make data-driven decisions. And as data professionals, this is actually what we want. But have you ever heard a phrase of humans are the weakest link? Uh, and as much as we hate to admit it, it is true. Depending on statistics you read, um, it's been reported that between 80 to 90% of all of data leaks and breaches are due to humans. So it could be a malicious intent, errors, or just simple negligence. Humans are um, kind of like the reasons why we have majority of data leaks. So how do we prevent that? So I'm sure many of you get vision simulations from your security teams, and sometimes we even fall for it, but that's okay. The goal of the simulations is to educate us humans on how to recognize and deal with phishing attacks. Um, regular consistent user education and training goes a long way and probably the simplest thing to implement. Strong passwords is a great strategy. Do it at work, do it for your home devices and anything that's important to you. And another way to minimize risk is, well, to minimize what data each user has access to. 
Perimeter security. Um, this layer is basically meant to prevent unauthorized physical access to uh, facilities or grounds. Um, it's very important to define the perimeter first. If you think about your backyard, uh, you might not care to protect it from chipmunks, squirrels, or raccoons. But if you have a garden, you might want to fence it in so they don't eat your tomatoes or your flowers. So some of the security controls are you know, pretty basic fences, walls, um, CCTV, barbed wire, et cetera. Network security. Um, so we established the perimeter in the previous layer, but now we need to figure out what data is transmitted across that perimeter to ensure that both data is secure as well as the device. Oh, there we go. Um, so network security consists of um, various policies, processes, and practices uh, that are meant to prevent, detect, and monitor unauthorized access. Um, secure network design is actually meant to ensure that even if a bad, bad actor gains access to your network, they're very limited in how far they can travel within it. So it's not like, you know, you get open the door to your house and you have access to all the rooms. So each room is still, we still try to lock all, all the rooms. So maybe you'll only have access to the kitchen. Um, so some of the things you'll see as security controls are um, zero trust network access, uh, VPNs, firewalls, as well as antivirus software. Endpoint security. So um, if we were in real kind of like room, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but because it's virtual, uh, no, nobody's gonna get shamed. Have you ever downloaded some data on your laptop? Like say, for example, downloaded some data from Snowside into Excel. Uh, I've done it. So Isn't endpoint that how you're supposed to do it? Yeah. <laughs> no. And Snowside conveniently has a button that allows you to download data into Excel. Um, we've all done it. It's okay. Um, it happens. So endpoint security is meant to protect our devices, like de desktop, laptops, um, our phones, um, um, whatever their um, iPads, etc. Uh, so there are controls like antivirus, endpoint encryption, uh, and endpoint protection and response solutions that provide basically continuous monitoring of end user devices. Um, there is also something called MDM, which is mobile device management, not master data management. Yeah. So when your help desk team says, I'm gonna install MDM on your laptop, it is not for master data management. So MD, MDM solutions basically allow teams to manage our devices remotely. Application security, um, it's uh, a process of developing, adding, and testing security features within applications to prevent vulnerabilities like DDoS, which is distributed denial of service attack, HTTP floods, good old SQL inje injections, uh, cross-site scripting, et cetera. To combat these, um, organizations usually use web application firewalls, WAFs, um, secure web gateway services. And sometimes it's really as simple as ensuring that the latest version of an application software is used and that appropriate patches are applied. I know good old patches, we forgot with some cloud solutions like SQLDBM for needing to do that, but I know behind the scene SQLDBM has a team that handles that. All right, data, we finally got to data. I know like security is such an amazing and exciting subject that we all just wanna talk about it. Um, cool, so finally, finally, interesting parts. So data is generally, especially nowadays, is the primary focus of attacks. And this is the layer that we must give the most care to. So various businesses have various types of data um, ranging from financial data, credit card information, payments, customer data. Um, this data could also be company's intellectual property and could be patented. Losing it uh, could have very negative impact on the company ranging from lost customer trust to actually lose, losing business or potential future opportunities. So what controls can we implement there? Well, one pattern to think about is minimizing the number of copies of data that we have. So if you're on Snowflake, um, consider 
using Snowflake secure data sharing as a method of data exchange instead of more traditional, for example, SFTP import export, uh, because it removes the need to have additional files of data copied across SFTP servers or blob storage devices. Another thing to consider is virtualization. What I mean by that is store your data in one table and access it via views. Um, we also need to classify, tag, mask, and anonymize our data. We'll have a demo for that later. Um, and where appropriate, we could also physically separate the compliant data from non-compliant data. One of the examples is PCI environment. So PCI environment is the environment that contains uh, credit card information. There is a lot of regulations and compliance around that. And generally, this is the environment that you want to completely separate from all of your other environments. Um, more, when we create data maps, don't forget about backups across all of your file servers, your cold storage devices, S3 buckets, etc. In Snowflake, we also need to remember that even if data is deleted, it can still be retrieved in the time travel. So depending on how far back your time travel goes, how much data you save. So keep that in mind. So while again, data is deleted, somebody can still access all data if it's um, stored in time travel. Um, I mentioned this already that the safest and most secure way to protect data is to follow the method of least privilege and basically to minimize access to data. But this goes completely against data democratization which is to enable all users in your organization to have universal access to data to truly unleash the power of data um, and propel companies forward. So which one do you choose? Are you for data democracy or data di dictatorship? Uh, we need to consider various regulations and compliances like HIPAA, which has to do with health care data, PCI, um, credit cards as I mentioned, GDPR, CCPA, to name a few. And now there are various AI compliances and regulations that are coming out of our way. So um, Snowflake, among other companies, have what I call a platform in the box. So as you're kind of trying to figure out what your platform should look like and all the, the features that it has to have and all the compliances and regulation it has to follow. So Snowflake has two editions, which is business critical and virtual private Snowflake that already have elevated security features like private connectivity and customer managed encryption keys. Both of these features are HIPAA and PCI compliant already. So uh, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to build it. You just can just kind of like buy this platform in the box. All right. Uh, and of course, mission critical assets is everything a business cannot function without. So this is kind of like what ultimately we're trying to protect. Depending on the type of business, um, mission critical assets could be people. It could be various data stores. It could be code repos. Uh, we don't need to protect every asset to the same level of rigor, rigor so it's important to classify each one. Uh, and there are three kind of like classifications of assets vital. Uh, its absence would be felt after a few hours to a day. Um, sensitive, uh, it would be one to several days before the loss of this asset is um, has any effect on business. In non-critical, so even if we never recover that asset, the, minim the impact on the business will be very minimal. As someone who really likes nice shoes, uh, I consider them to be my vital asset. So as you can imagine, they're very protected. Um, okay, data vault, 30 seconds. Uh, this is basically at the highest level, Data Vault is a method and architecture for delivering information to the business. Um, it's a modern agile way of designing and building effective data warehouse solutions. One of the features of the Data Vault methodology is separation of concerns. So Data Vault keeps data organized in kind of like a business focused way at the ingestion. Um, so Data Vault, architecture and modeling also makes it easy to separate data based on security and compliance concerns. So this is kind of what I'm gonna show you today. And I mean, after all, Dan Lissett came up with it while he was working for the Department of Defense. So if there was ever a secure platform architecture, Data Vault is it. Um, so in Data Vault, uh, the model is focused on kind of reflecting the business. Uh, there are three types of tables, hubs that contain all business keys, links that contain relationship between those 
business keys and satellites uh, have all descriptive attributes. And this diagram is just showing you that all of those tables can be loaded in parallel. Again, we don't have much time to dive into Data Vault, but if you're curious, again, uh, please sign up for the Data Vault user group. Uh, that'll um, be the next webinar where we combine <laughs> powers. Oh, in incredible. Or sign up for the next webinar. Um, incredible. So demo, finally. My gosh, already 15 minutes in. Uh, this is a lot more fun. So superhero data. And it's not because I'm a snowflake data superhero, is uh, my absolute favorite. One, is because most people understand and can relate to it. And two, it's just as messy and dirty as any other data any of us ever worked with. So today, we are going to use Snowflake data classification to identify some BII, or being identifiable information. Uh, we're going to create and apply tags on some columns that contain BII. We're going to create and apply masking policy to our tag. We are going to use role-based access control to allow some users to see data in clear text, and for some, it will be masked. Um, we'll, set, we'll use Data Vault to separate BII data from the rest of the attributes, and then we'll action the right to be forgotten for one of our superheroes who decided to retire and no longer wanted to be part of any databases. Before I leave my slides, um, I'll share all those links, but this is some of the kind of like information and how to find me again, QR code, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. And with that, I am going to stop this and jump into Snowflake. So all of this code is in GitHub. I just want to stress, just like imagine I'm ChatGPT, Everything I'm sharing with you, please make sure you test it first. In the non-production environment, don't take my word for it. This is a sample data and, and I made it work so the demo goes smoothly. So please, please, please test. The code is here. Um, play around with it and make it better. So I already loaded data, my superhero data into uh, a database. They're actually... I believe four different, well, let's make sure demo works, four different sources of the superhero data that I have. Um, so fun, fun stuff. Um, so there's code to load it, but let's start with data classification. So what I'm doing here is I actually want to store um, a result of data classification that I run into a table. Uh, both because it's easier than to create automation on it, and, and I just kind of want to keep the history. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm creating a new schema in my raw database called admin, and I'm creating a table to store output of my data classification. All right, all done. Cool. So what we're going to do next is create a new role with permissions to run data classification. So I kind of want to have a separate role, which I could potentially, all right. Let's see if the demo gods will co cooperate with me today. So I want to have a separate role, data classification that I could give to my, um, I guess, data stewards or someone. <laughs> uh, data stewards, I guess, is not a cool term anymore, but we could give to a team that will be responsible for data classification. So I'm going to create a role. I'm going to grant this role to sysadmin because I don't like orphan roles. I'm going to create a separate warehouse um, specifically dedicated to running data classification. Uh, one thing you notice, which is I was lazy and I didn't specify anything else about this data warehouse except for the name. It defaults to extra small. Good thing, because if it defaulted to extra large, I would run out of credits in my sample Snowflake account. So not something you want to ever do in production, be explicit in your data warehouse, make sure you have definitions, but I was being lazy. So I'm going to give data classification role permissions to this warehouse. And I'm also going to grant imported privileges on Snowflake. So Snowflake is an amazing database that has a lot of metadata about our accounts. So, but it's a data share. So I want to make sure that data classification has access to this data share and can run some metadata queries. 
All right, some more permissions. So I'm gonna give data classification permissions to my raw database. And because again, I'm partially lazy, but partially because I hate having too many roles, I am actually gonna also give data classification permission to apply tags. So whoever has this role not only can classify data, can, they can also kind of like manage and apply tags. All right, so all fun stuff here. I am giving permissions on the materialized view here, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. So, and of course, permissions to write to the data classification table. So let's do some data classification. I know you're like all excited about permissions. This is probably an even less exciting subject than talking about uh, security layers. All right, so some metadata functions that you can run, uh, for example, um, get tag allowed values. We'll dive into each one of these in a little bit. But let's look at my table first. So here is information. One of the tables of my superheroes has a name, gender, race, height, publisher. Pretty cool data if you're like excited about superheroes. So I'm going to apply this data classification function, extract semantic categories. What this function does is um, it basically, it scans the table, it's Snowflake's implementation of data classification. So they're actually very clear about it. If you have any other tools to help you classify your data, they might have slightly different kind of like definitions and implementations, but this is ultimately what it returns. So it told me that column name gender is gender and it's quasi identifier. We'll take a look at what it is. Uh, most of the columns are populated and it's pretty confident that it is gender. So the number here is sampling size. You can go from one to 10,000, I believe. I just picked 500, doesn't matter. So some of the things about data classification, it's an enterprise feature. You can run it on an extra small warehouse, uh, but it might take a while. So if you have a very, very large data, data set and you have a lot of tables, so it might take a while, but it's fine. It doesn't support um, geography, binary, or variant data types. Um, Snowflake suggests that you do a lateral flatten for your variant, but instead I decided to create a materialized view. So I, I actually flatten my JSON in the materialized view and then I can apply data classification. That's why I gave permission um, to um, materialized views. So semantics category, um, this is how kind of Snowflake defines it. Uh, it flags, so notice here, this is identifier and this is quasi-identifier. So here's the difference. Identifier uniquely identifies an individual. And here's some of the examples. Quasi-identifier is non-sensitive PII. So by itself, like for example, gender doesn't actually identify an individual, but in, in combination with some other Quasi-identifier, it could uniquely identify an individual. So there is also um, sensitive identif identifier, which is basically something that doesn't uniquely identify an individual, but an individual might not want to share it. And salary is the only one that's so far listed in this. Um, a new thing in Snowflake, which happened after the summit, they, they used to only support classifying US data based on kind of like US identifiers, but now they also included support for EU, UK, and Australia. So for example, phone numbers, it would actually tell you whether it's a US phone number or a EU phone number. All right, cool. So now I'm gonna be lazy. I'll generate quickly code to classify my data and load it into a table. So and while it's, it's running that, might take like a minute. And this is where I regret not um, getting a larger warehouse <laughs> to run it faster. Um, we can talk about the weather. How's the weather? Serge, Beautiful you're like, in, windy, you're in paradise, I, right? I used to be. And then it you know, just overnight, it turned into autumn, went from summer to autumn right away. Um, Actually, I have a question for people maybe who aren't as familiar with tags before we start applying them. Can you give folks an overview, either you or Keith, 
on how a tag object is different from most other database objects in, in a Snowflake schema. Oh, I'll give it to Keith. <laughs> Put me on the spot. <clears throat> um, so from my perspective, most objects are at a variety of levels. Like this is a schema object. This is a, a database object. This is a column object. A tag um, kind of sits at, well, it is a schema object, right? But it can be applied to many objects at different levels, right? So if I create, and I think the best practice, and I don't know, you're probably going to this, is to create your tags in a kind of a central um, schema. And then you can leverage that across multiple databases, multiple schemas, and apply them at your table level, your column level, right? Um, and you can leverage them in a variety of ways in that fashion. So I think that hopefully that's the right answer to search to you, but that's the way, it, way oh, I see it. I, I'm glad <laughs> I followed the best practice to me. It just seemed logical. I, I think right. tags, if you any of you use Jira software, there's a concept of labels, and then they're like all over the place. So you don't want to do that. So you actually want to be consistent. I think what I love and hate about Snowflake is the flexibility to create mess. Uh, kind of like roles is a great example. You create as many roles you want, but then you get into this chaos of like, I don't know what's used where. So tags, you're right. You can create them in a schema, in any schema, but like kind of like standardize on them is a good right. idea. Search, mm -hmm. is that, what were you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I'm not thinking anything. I'm completely. <laughs> See, I just, you know, I'm just asking open-ended questions and making sure. you sweat. I have a of lesson course. learned on that. You know, I, I learned. I can say I learned the hard way, or learned, you know, doing it. Is I had created the tags in a specific schema, in a specific database that I used for cloning. Um, and what I realized is, if the tag is created in um, a database that you clone. Um, your data policies don't go along. So if you have the, the schema that you create the tags in, it's its own schema that you don't clone, but you're cloning. This is getting very confusing. If you clone the database that you've applied the tags to, those tags go along for the ride on the clone. And then the definition of the tag and any data policies associated to it are staying in a centralized. So that's when I really noticed that have, like you said, a strategy around your tags, centralize the maintenance of them, and then apply them to databases and schemas that you want throughout your account. So, so yeah. Keith, are you telling me that it's possible to have tags in a schema separated that a certain user may not even have access to, but they can, they might potentially have the, the grants to apply those tags? but also clone existing objects that they own with the tags already applied. Is that correct? Correct. So the, the creation of the tags in a certain schema, right, could be from a certain role, um, but I could apply that tag, reference that tag in that other schema in another database and schema. Um, and then if I have the ability to clone it, again, that the definition of that tag and where it's located would go along with that so it's process. extremely powerful from from a security perspective that you can separate the object rights from from who's going to be doing some of those policy administrations, right? Correct. Right, and that's back to that yeah, that to that security is who's defining the policy, right? The data policy associated to that, separated from those who are applying the tag to the you know, I'll say a column object or a table object. But yeah. okay, and as far as again, just. Let's cover tags just so people have the complete picture for what Veronica is about to show what us. What we're going to do next. Sorry. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll get there. Great questions, though. Um, so again, this is demo, kind of like to Serge's point. You can get very granular. Certain people can classify data. Certain people can create tags. And certain other roles should can apply tags. Not what I'm doing in my demo. I have one role. But based on kind of the problem you're trying to solve, the complexities that you need to overcome and kind of like the separation, just keep that in mind that you have ability to be pretty granular and very focused in the type of permissions that each role has. Um, so classification creates, just kind of want to go through quickly, uh, a JSON. We can parse it. And it basically picked on various different things. Uh, in even in my kind of like 
fake data set. These are all the names. And why I'm showing you the names is because um, this is the ones that I'm gonna apply my tag to. So I'm gonna create a materialized view, like I said, um, because one of my tables has JSONs and we can't, come on, Snowflake. <laughs> You're failing me today. Um, we will create a, once it decides to cooperate with me, um, materialized view that's gonna parse the JSON. The, the other thing that I wanted to kind of share with you, my handy data script to actually create parsing of JSON. I don't like to type it all. I just run the script, it extracts all the elements out of my JSON. Um, Maybe we can open it one more time. There you go. All right. Um, so this is data. Come on. What's happening? Maybe you should have defaulted to the Excel. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so this is what data looks like. You know, we're on. Uh, classification, nothing happens, it's empty. I'm gonna extract my JSON. I'm gonna create a view. And, and then I'm gonna switch to data classification role and run my data classification and and here we go. So um, these are my all the fields that I have in my materialized view. And as you notice, now it picked up on some URLs as well as names. All right. Now we are stepping into um, this is I'm going to create basically two roles, one for regular allowed to read just regular without BII and another one with elevated privileges to actually read all the uh, BII data. So I'm just gonna kick this off quickly. And then we're gonna go into actual masking policies and tags, which is the fun part. All right, so I am giving data classification, again, this is demo, same role. I'm giving it permissions to apply masking policy on the entire account, not granular to just one database. I'm actually letting it run it across my entire demo account. And here we go. I am creating, which I'm glad I'm following best practices. I'm creating a tag in my admin schema. So uh, I'm not happy with this naming convention, but you can call it whatever you want. But basically, this is saying that being identifiable information string, so could be name, could be address, I'm going to apply the same tag with the same masking policy. So I'm going to create this tag. And this is my masking policy. It is saying, unless you're analyst with BI permission or sysadmin, your data, the data that you'll see will be masked and I'm using an MD5 hash. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want the value to be deterministic. So the same string will always result in the same MD5 hash. Uh, so I can do some analytics on it. I can count distinct values. I can do things. So I still cannot click, see clear test, clear text. I can't reverse engineer what this hash, what the value is. So again, this is your choice. You can add stars, you can add whatever you wanna do in your masking policy. And now I am adding this masking policy on this tag. So any field that I applied this tag to will be masked following the same policy. Okay, well now let's actually apply our tag and see what happens. So, these are all the columns that were identified as name. Um, I'm gonna, 
So this is what I'm doing. So alter table, it could be view, um, modify column set tag. So now I'm applying all my tags on all my columns that were classified as a name. All right, and this is basically metadata if you want to look it up. Um, it tells you everything kind of like we've done and here's another way to, um, this is our masking policy. All right, demo. Can I ask a quick question on behalf of uh, one of our participants? Um, yeah. Can you briefly explain to folks, because we've, we've even covered them here, we have several concepts. We have snowflake tags, we have data classification, and we have query tags, which we have not covered. Can you touch on uh, what each one of those is and how they differ? Sure. Um, probably starting from kind of like backwards. Query tags is the way to label a query for easier analytics later on, which is different from what we're talking about. Right now, we're talking about tagging specific types of data in order to kind of like organize and protect it if necessary. So these are the tags we're talking about here. That's why I classified data first. I wanted to identify um, compliant data or like PII in our case, which is names, addresses, social security numbers, URLs. I group them together by saying, I am gonna apply a tag to every column and every table that contains this type of data. And then I said, and oh, by the way, I actually don't want everybody to be able to see this data. And this is where kind of like my virtualized comes in. The point that I mentioned, I only have data stored in one table. Everybody accesses the same table, but based on their permission, they can either view it or it's masked. So I'm kind of hitting on various things that I covered previously. Um, so again, query tags are slightly different. Query tags help you like troubleshooting, aggregate similar queries or queries coming from the same process. So you can figure out basically what your jobs are doing. Any other things to um, search, Keith? Nothing to add. You nailed it. Um, so in an example, role analyst, remember this was not the role that was allowed to see unmasked data. So this is the name. So it actually masks it. Same, I applied it to various tables. Um, so same situation. Every table, same tag, same masking policy uh, values are masked. Um, and again, the reason why I used hash instead of just doing like star, star, star one uh, is because I can do some queries and analytics on it. For example, I wanted to see um, which name had more than one record. So I can do this. I still don't know who that is, but I can do kind of like different analytics. So now if I change my role to uh, analyst BII, uh, querying, same query, same table, now I can see this in clear text. Um, all right. So let's see. We have only 15 minutes left, so I'm going to pause. Uh, the next step was just basically split data into separation, uh, into um, put BII data into one table and the rest of it in another and kind of put it together in the MART and apply again the same tag with the same masking policy and same uh, role roles. Uh, but I'm going to stop here so everybody can rerun this demo on their own play around, see what you can come, come up with. And I just want to give Serge and Keith an opportunity to show off what SQL DBM does with tags. Sure. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to, again, pass to the experts to make sure we covered uh, exactly what Snowflake tags represent in, in themselves. So um, you can think of tags sort of as a, a label, but they're not exactly a label. They're actually key value pairs. So just so people understand kind of what a tag is and what it can do. A tag is a key value pair. So it has a name and then it also has a label. So in the example we're gonna look at, we're gonna see a tag called medallion, medallion status, and medallions as we know have uh, gold, silver, and bronze values. 
Uh, so this is one type of tag. Uh, another tag could be value less, meaning you can assign any, it doesn't have an assigned value list, but you can assign any value to it. And we're going to see an example of, of that tag as well. And another thing which we, again, it's a, there's, there's a million things you can tackle with, with tags. They are also, there's also inheritance that plays a role. So up and down the, um, the schema database schema object tags are passed down from one parent to its child children so tags on a table apply to its columns tags on a schema apply to its tables and so forth so um we will share the links as we said to all of the code that we've been using in the examples and i wanted to just share my screen and give give something of a, of a visual overview because there's a lot of there's a lot of coding there's a lot of functions that we can implement in the service of tags of identifying what's been tagged what possible tag values are but like working with anything really in a database you're pretty much seeing a, a list of objects or you're seeing a tabular result to some query and when we're talking about data democratization giving access to you know the the lovable data stewards of the world they may not be the most tech savvy individuals so um with a visual tool if you're going to be democratizing governance consumption discoverability this is one of the things that um if you're going to democratize data you're going to want to facilitate for your users so I have here an appropriately titled awesome project. Um, it is indeed awesome. And I have also followed best practices in creating a separate tag schema where I have created some, some sample tags. And uh, I, I want to demonstrate a scenario of Again, you can use tags in any amount, any number of ways. Um, so Veronica was demonstrating of a, a combined feature of you can pair a tag with a masking policy and easily uh, apply those through the tagging mechanism. You can have a tag separately without a, a masking policy, and it's just a metadata classification type of scenario. So you can set a tag to then later be able to isolate those tables, those objects, those columns, but you can use those for whatever purposes you want, for masking, for uh, reporting, quality control, et cetera. So I'm just gonna demonstrate a sample scenario of how tags might be, might be used. So I'm looking at a physical uh, schema. And again, this would be similar to helping navigate your way around your Snowflake um, landscape for a user that may not be familiar. So imagine they just joined yesterday or they've just come in. Uh, you were looking at a physical detailed rendering of your, of your schema. We could also be looking at this just from an exploratory kind of what is the entity relationship description type of view. And you can see again, visually, some of these have you know, the appropriately labeled uh, tag icon. And this is information that you would normally have to pull out of your information schema of where your tagged objects are or run the, the functions to understand which tags are being applied. Whereas using a, a guided visual tool, you can, first of all, administer your tags, create your tags without having to remember the syntax, the grants, et cetera. Um, we can handle those on, on deployment. But more of the use case of I have a table, right click, add a tag. Um, I don't have to remember, I don't have to query separately what those allowed values are. So let's say this is silver. Um, or in the other direction, what has been tagged as um, what has been tagged with an issue or a medallion status, jump to those tables, objects, or columns and explore exactly what it is i'm looking for so in this scenario oops, i need to zoom out 
I am labeling my data quality with medallions. So what is ready for what is the customer facing data, meaning medallion gold? Um, what is the like the the advanced analytics type? We can give them the silver access and bronze. This is raw schema. This is temporary tables. This is things in in review. And I can already use this information to navigate around my my diagram and say I'm actually interested in in the issues. So show me all. Um, all areas that have been tagged with with issues and we have one table here that we can click on the table and review the the tag of medallion status and let's go to the physical implementation so i've actually tagged this column as an issue and this is no longer maintained so the issues tag as we remember has no allowed values list, meaning I can write whatever I want. And I can use this informationally. So I can just query all issues and then review them based on whatever input versus the medallion status, which has a predetermined list of, of user controls uh, input values. Um, very high level. Again, we can't get through all the things you can do with, with tags, but this is one way to, to use this feature, uh, filtering, searching, we can administer tags in our in terms of um, documentation and governance. So we have a, a data dictionary screen, which you can use the UI. You can use Excel import export, where all of the allowed values and things like that are also considered. And I still want to leave some room for questions, so I'll just go really quickly and use them to whatever needs are are present in your organization so this was one of the questions that was asked earlier so i'll, I'll take a stab at it and then i'll open it up to our panel of data superheroes uh, how would an organization even use tags to to begin with and I think the first question that you would need to start with is what are you trying to accomplish? If you think of a tag just theoretically as a label, how are you trying, what kind of, of classification or what kind of division or segmentation are you trying to apply in the data that you use? So Veronica's demo was very heavily focused on data security, privacy, um, things that might be audited in a GDPR type of privacy review. Uh, but that's just one application. Another application might just be like I've done in this demo, um, quality control, flagging, um, flagging fields. So since they don't, they don't conflict with the, the DDL, the columns themselves, unless you're applying a masking policy. It's, a, it's almost like applying a comment or something at a metadata level. So you, you have the table, you have the column, you're not changing any structures, you're not giving people access to your schema, but a governance team can just come in and flag a certain um, data set as problematic or under review or, or vice versa, cleared for company-wide reporting. So that would just be one, um, one application, but Keith, I think, has a lot more experience from the field in terms of how he's seen these things used. No, I think you kind of hit it right on in terms of you need to have that. Don't you don't want to just go start creating tags. It's it's what's what's the problem, I guess you could say you're trying to solve how tags maybe that so you just said uh Veronica was talking about tags can be used for um security purposes. Um, they could also be for if you're doing just cost management, understanding who's doing what, maybe segregating what which different domains are doing what in the database. So there's a variety of of way. But yeah, to start with, it's really have that strategic discussion, and then where are you putting the tags? What are you going to call them? And then how are you going to manage them and stuff? So, yeah. And a great example. So the way to organize tables in our database, right? You only really have two, two layers, right? Like you have a database and then you have schema and then you have to go into naming conventions. Now you can apply tags and it's another way to organize your object, whatever they are. Again, I was heavily focused on security and governance, but 
it's it just it just a label and it helps you organize things in a different way. Um, there is a great question, and I wonder if maybe SQLDO can help with that. Um, do classification tags flow automatically from Data Vault to Mart or even from raw tables into your warehouse tables? Uh, not automatically in Snowflake, but it sounds like it's a metadata-driven column lineage sort of thing. So can maybe SQLDBM automate, help automate that? Mm -hmm. we're, we're working in that direction. So we have, I mean, first of all, we respect the Snowflake uh, inheritance of tags. So if they're set on a schema, then they will flow down um, to, to the underlying objects. We have things coming up that will allow you to automatically apply tags through templates, whether those are table templates or column level templates. And this way, the table templates are specifically thought to be used in scenarios like data vault or just repeatable scenarios where you might have like a staging table with predefined columns or type two dimension with predefined columns. In which case you'd be able to also set your tags, uh, predefine which columns would be would be using them, and then just automate and, and reapply and reapply the same template. You know, one thing to add there again, just um, kind of a, a data vault specific um, best practice, right? Is that your information marts, you know, you want to make them virtual if all possible. And the one great thing with Snowflake tags is if I was to place tags on top of columns within my raw vault and I generate virtual marts with views, you do not have to reapply a tag at the view. It will inherit the tag on the view at the physical table. So that is one way within Snowflake, it'll just absorb that um, tag um, if you're doing virtual marts uh, per the recommended best practice of, of data. So <laughs> another plus one for virtualizing. Um, That's right. Across the board. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this one is going to test our superhero powers of trivia. How many tags can be applied to an object? Who remembers this? I don't remember from top of my head, and I didn't want to cheat and Google it. Uh, <laughs> Keith is playing the price is right. Yeah, definitely one tag. One dollar. <laughs> um, I will. I will say again. Let another lesson. Even though you can apply a tag at a table level and then at a column level, if you have a data policy associated to that tag and a tag is applied at the table level, you cannot apply another data policy assigned tag to a column. So if you're going to apply data policy tags at the column, you have to remove it from the table. And kind of a little bit of experience there was when I would get a new table, I would apply it at the table level because I don't know anything about the table and I assumed everything was, um, you know, uh, personal. But until you did the classification stuff that you were showing Veronica to then know the column level, then I would switch it from table level tag to a column level tag. So just another, yeah. you know, FYI. Exactly. So it's kind of like so, one of those like lousy, it depends answers. <laughs> Make sure like Snowflake is so incredibly flexible that it allow you to do whatever. But from operational management perspective and you trying to then detangle everything you're building, kind of like draw it on the napkin first, kind of mm -hmm. like figure out what you're trying to do. Or in Keith's example, like I do it kind of like big bang first and then I, I I go into specific details uh that that's a great approach as well yeah I actually also don't know the answer I remember it was I think something like 50 values for a tag if you're doing allowed values and then something in the hundreds of allowed tags per object and they stack up so if you have schema tags that are inherited they all count towards that limit but it's a ridiculous limit. So if you have a hundred tags on on your on any given object or a set of objects, what are you? How useful are, are these tags to? And, the, to and I would also say maybe tomorrow Snowflake will come up with a new limit, and <laughs> this conversation will be wrong. So yes, uh, I'll just cram before I take the recertification test in a bit. Exactly. <laughs> There's a... Like study five minutes before the test. That's the only way to make sure that you actually have know all the up to date answers. Okay. Um, do we have time for, yeah, we've got time for one more. Um, sins of omission of how do you tackle 
if you haven't had any experience with tags, you've got, I would say, a robust schema and you've never assigned any tags, how do you tackle going back and starting to, to tag things? Oh, usually when you're so deep into something and you want to make changes to it, I would start with something that is has the, the smallest blast radius. Um, find one table, one role, or maybe create a new role. Uh, use that one table that's not heavily used, and you can look at your query history to figure it out and start with that. Um, these things are very risky of how, again, when you, with the flexibility, you create tangled web of things, uh, fixing that after the fact is incredibly difficult and it breaks everything. Um, so I usually, like, again, try to tackle with the whatever has the smallest blast rate, potential blast radius if it breaks. And have always, always have a plan B. You roll back, you back up recovery, how do you restore? N never um, go through like a one-way door where you can't come back. Um, okay. But just to put people at ease, you can't break anything with just tags. Well, masking, right. if you apply masking, exactly. like just tags, right? I'm Again, I'm thinking masking. Great, call out on the assumption. I'm like, why would you tag <laughs> anything else? You want to mask it. Uh, and then, oops, nobody can see anything. That's great. Exactly. But it's safe. Yes, tags alone are perfectly safe. <laughs> true, true. Uh, you might have to clean up your mess if you set too many <laughs> of them, but uh, they will not restrict your data. They will not hide your tables. They, they are purely classification labels. Cool. Yeah, I think that we're we're out of time and we've got so yeah, many other great. questions. So we'll we might be able to address some of those afterwards in a in a written Q and A response. But thank you so much. This uh, it's never enough. One hour. Yeah. We need to we need to extend these. But thank you so much, Veronica, for joining us. Keith, as usual, awesome to have you. And thank yeah, you for thank everyone you. who yeah. who stuck around. Um, thank you for the great questions. So we'll we'll do more of these definitely. Data vault tags policies oh all great topics thank you so much <laughs>